Welcome to Mount Herzl in Jerusalem. The National Memorial Mountain gets its name from the visionary of the state, Theodore Herzl. Herzl, the leader of the Zionist movement, died at the age of 44 and left behind the World Zionist Organization with one goal, establishing a Jewish state in the land of Israel. 45 years after his passing and just one year after the establishment of the state, Theodore Herzl was brought to his final resting place on the top of this mountain. At the entrance to the mountain, there is the Herzl Museum, which tells the story of the visionary of the state and connects us to his Zionist dream. Our museum follows the different stages of Herzl's Zionist journey and his path to becoming the leader of the Zionist movement. Herzl's dream was to establish a state for the Jewish people. And for us, it has become a reality. As Herzl said, for all human deeds have begun with a dream, and dreams shall they become. And if you would but will it, it is more than a dream. We know Herzl as the visionary of the state, but in order to make money, he worked as a journalist. Herzl worked for the largest newspaper in Europe at the time, called the Neue Freie Presse, and he was a correspondent stationed in Paris. And as a correspondent, he went to go cover the largest trial going on at the time, the trial of Alfred Dreyfus. Alfred Dreyfus was a Jewish officer in the French army who was accused of treason. Herzl was present at the ceremony where Dreyfus was publicly stripped of his rank and had his sword broken. Herzl heard the crowd shouting death to the Jews. These anti-Semitic calls showed Herzl how deeply rooted the anti-Semitism was in Europe at the time. This drew Herzl to try and find a solution to the problem of anti-Semitism and started him on his Zionist endeavor. On February 14, 1896, Herzl published his first book called The Jewish State. In this book, Herzl proposed to establish a safe haven for the Jewish people away from anti-Semitism. The Jewish State was Herzl's point-by-point -point outline on how to practically reach this goal. Soon after the Jewish State was published, it was quickly translated into over a dozen different languages. People from around the world began reading Herzl's book and it became a controversial bestseller. On the one hand, some people viewed Herzl as the Messiah and rallied around him, while others thought Herzl was crazy and ruined any last chance of having equal rights for the Jews. Herzl nevertheless continued on his Zionist journey and a year and a half later convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. Welcome to the Municipal Hall in Basel, Switzerland. How did we get here? Herzl's first book, The Jewish State, gains momentum, and Herzl begins to gather supporters around the idea of a state for the Jews. In just a year and a half, Herzl brings them into this hall to unite forces as Jews and ask an important question. What's the next step? What are we going to do to save the Jewish people? For the first time in 2,000 years, community representatives from all over the world gather in their finest attire to discuss the Jewish future. The first Zionist Congress opens up with the blessing of Sheikh Yadu, the prayer recited at special occasions to express gratitude to God for enabling us to reach this occasion. This is followed by 15 minutes of applause before Herzl is able to give his address. In his speech, Herzl declares that Zionism is a return to Judaism, even before it is a return to our land. After the first Congress, Herzl reflects in his diary and writes, In Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be answered by universal laughter. Perhaps in five years, certainly in 50, everyone will know it. Herzl convenes a total of six Congresses in his lifetime in which they discuss ways to establish a Jewish state. In 1903, a pogrom breaks out in Kishinev, causing Herzl to seek immediate shelter for the Jews. In the Sixth Zionist Congress, Herzl proposes the Uganda Plan, a plan to establish an interim state in Uganda, 
Because while Herzl believes that the ultimate goal is to establish a state for the Jews in our historic homeland, the safety of Jews takes priority. The Sixth Zionist Congress, the Uganda Congress, is also known as the Congress of Tears because of the rift it creates within the movement. On the one hand, we have an obligation to save Jews and on the other, a desire to remain loyal to Zion. To emphasize his commitment to Zion, Herzl ends the Congress with these words. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Contrary to popular belief, Herzl only visited the land of Israel once in his lifetime. On October 26, 1898, Herzl, along with four of his colleagues, arrived in the land of Israel. The purpose of the trip was to meet with the German Kaiser to receive a charter, national auspices, for a state for the Jews. Herzl spent seven days out of his 10-day journey in Jerusalem. He visited the Western Wall and the Mount of Olives. Herzl saw the potential that the then city in ruins had. This trip enabled Herzl to meet with those who lived in the land of Israel and learn about their way of life and the challenges that he may encounter when establishing a Jewish state. A few days before Herzl's trip came to an end, he had a special audience with the German Kaiser in Jerusalem. The Kaiser did not grant the chart and the trip did not reach its goal in Herzl's eyes. Nevertheless, this trip inspired Herzl's second book, Alt Neuland, which describes Herzl's utopian vision for a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Welcome to Herzl's original study from his home in Vienna. Herzl died at the young age of just 44 years old and he left behind a wife and three children. Upon his death, his wife Julie discovered that not only did Herzl spend all of his time and energy on the Zionist movement, he also spent all of the family's money, leaving them very poor. So a close friend of Herzl's and fellow Zionist leader, David Wolfson, decides to help the family out and buys all of his belongings. He does this in order to support the family, but also because he knows the historical value that this room is going to have in the future. This room gives us an insight into who Herzl was as a person, not just as a Zionist leader. For example, we have busts of his parents, Jacob and Jeanette, who stood by him and supported him throughout his life when everyone else was calling him crazy. When Herzl was a young child, his mother told him, one day you are going to change the world. And she was right. Along the back wall, we can see shelves and shelves of books in seven different languages. Herzl was very educated and his library contained a variety of books from philosophy to economics. But Herzl not only loved to read, he also loved to write. In his life, he wrote two books, many articles, plays, and he kept dozens and dozens of journals and planners. In these, he would write what he was thinking, where he was going, who he was meeting, essentially the Zionist story at the time. In 1960, this room was brought for display here to the Herzl Museum, and since then, it has been the heart of this museum. Before Herzl died, he requested in his will to be buried in the land of Israel. But when he died in 1904, this wasn't a possibility, so instead he was buried in Vienna in the family plot. But in 1949, just a year after the establishment of the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, decided as one of his first acts to bring Herzl, his parents, and his sister to be reburied here in Israel. Behind me, we can see a replica of the tapestry that was on Herzl's coffin when he was reburied in Jerusalem. This tapestry shows us the two different sides of Herzl, the Jewish side and the universal side. At the top, there are two verses. The first verse is from Ezekiel, from the prophecy of the dried bones, which describes God taking the bones of those buried outside the land of Israel and returning them to the land, which is essentially what was done with Herzl. The second verse is from Psalms and tells us that those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. At the bottom, we can see Herzl's universal side. These are the last few sentences from his first book, The Jewish State. And in these sentences, Herzl describes that a state for the Jewish people will not only be beneficial to the Jews themselves, but also to the whole world at large. 
In the center of the tapestry, we can see two symbols that Herzl suggested for the future flag of the Jewish state. On the left, there are seven stars of David that represent the seven-hour workday that Herzl idealized. And on the right, we can see a lion inside of a star of David that represents Jewish pride and Jewish strength. At the bottom of the tapestry, it says that the women of Vienna made this in 1936. But we know that Herzl was reburied in Israel in 1949. So this shows us that 13 years before Herzl was reburied, the Jewish people were already looking forward to bringing the visionary of the state to be reburied in his homeland.